Hello, everybody. Wow, it has been a little while. Gosh, so <laughs> I guess a couple of housekeeping or items in order. Um, items. So you might have noticed my background is a little bit different. So basically, I know I've taken a bit of a break from streaming. A uh, lot of things going on. Personal life, just uh, sort of dealing uh, with some sort of family emergencies, some loss. And so it's been it's been a bit of a month. But one of the new things that's come out of this is I'm actually coming to you live right now from the West Coast, so sunny California. And so as a result, as much as I wanted to move all of my stuff with me, uh, the bookshelf with all the Funko Pop, that was a little tricky. So, you know, I think at some point I'll try to get something in the background to kind of like, you know, a little bit of a throwback and then maybe do something a little bit new with the space. But yeah, so I'll be uh, streaming here from the West Coast for a little bit. And okay, so with that said, let's go ahead, let's kick it off, shall we? All right, so let me, I still need to get all my gear set up for like switching screen and stuff, but let's go ahead. Oh, wrong thing. Good thing we're not recording. Okay, here we go. Boom. So first thing first, let's talk about the very first question we're going to discuss today, which is around the idea of processing non-technical notes. So let's go ahead and actually let me do this. Let me start by, so I'm gonna go, let me make sure the obsidian is showing up. So let's start off with this question, which Joshua has been very patiently waiting for some of these questions. So we're gonna cover some of this first uh, to kind of kick it off. Okay, no, I don't want to link the, I need to figure out what I'm doing with the refactory on that. Anyways, I don't wanna embed that just yet. Okay, great, let's do this. So the question here is around the idea of processing non-technical notes. So the question I want to tackle right now is from Joshua, and it's around this idea of how to process non-technical notes within Obsidian. So basically, as we can see here in the question, so for example, last week I read the blog on how to write CFPs and took notes. You know, how do I make sure to use those points or to keep only notes that I'm talking about when the non-technical ones during note taking. So basically it's like, from what I'm getting here from this question, it's about this idea that like when we take notes and learn things, there are some things that are really technical and it's easy to take notes on. There are some things that are non-technical that are kind of like, I'll call it a little bit, I don't wanna use the word soft, but like it's like, it's harder to like conceptualize what's going on within the note, right? So you might have either more images or ways of representing data that might not be as simple as like, here's the code snippet that I learned and this is how I map data within JavaScript. Like that's like very prescriptive. Some things like if we're talking about like communication skills and those sort of things, those are trickier to reference on a larger scale. So I would say, so basically for my outline on this. So basically I would say, Josh, when it comes to working with non-technical ideas, because a lot of times the technical, the non-technical concepts represent sort of a lot of different things and you're going to be working through it. Cause remember a lot of times I think when we think about notes, we think of it like we're writing like an essay. It needs to be like perfect. But if we take it from the approach of a draft document, right, where you're just sort of building on it over time, the key thing to non-technical notes is one, allowing those notes to build, but then most importantly, then knowing how to reference specific sections of those notes. So for example, if we were to talk about, let's see, I mean, um, the one I, the think again is the book, honestly, I keep coming up with over and over again. And this is a book, really, if you want to talk about non-technical skills and that kind of stuff, Think Again does a great job really around sort of philosophical concepts um, around the idea of rethinking ideas, right? So let's talk about, let's see, uh, the joy of being wrong. Let's go in here, for example. Okay, so there is a ton of stuff in here, some of it very, very factual, some of it just ideas. And so let's, let's pick a point here, for example. Da, 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 da. Okay, here, this is an interesting one regarding like attachment to ideas. And so I uh, see some of the things that I picked out from this included the idea that discovering that you're wrong about something is something that you should actually value, right? And it's not, not something that we should find offensive to our basically as our identity, right? And so detaching our ideas from who we are is a really important part to learning how to rethink ideas and to grow as individuals. And so this quote here, for example, who you are should be a question of what you value, not what you believe. Values are a core principle in life, and they might be excellence, generosity, freedom and fairness, or security and integrity. And I really loved this idea uh, when I read it. 
And so if you're, uh, so in particularly in Josh's example here, or Joshua's example, CFPs for, in, for those who don't know, at least I'm assuming the CFPs here is referring to call for papers. <laughs> if you're talking about something else, my apologies, maybe you're talking about something because that was the S is capitalized, but I'm going to spin it, I think, um, with what I understand the acronym to be. So if you're like writing about papers, right, and let's say you're trying to figure out what conference talk you're trying to propose. Uh, this is where the referencing notes, knowing how to anchor them is really important. So if let's say this is an outline. So the example here is say talk outline for thinking differently. And so, uh, you know, I might have a bunch of facts, right? I might be like, well, the brain can retain, you know, like, you know, five to seven items with a standard deviation of two, you know, like those are like facts you can refer to. But for something where you're like, okay, there's something a little bit like more like I, I want to grasp this thing that I took notes somewhere else. Again, the block reference is your key here because as you can see here, this is just a, a I wrote this note and like organized it in a way that was based on how I felt at the time and sort of like basically like you see here as I'm processing the information. And so because I'm processing it, it's not necessarily delineated in a way that's really easy to understand from like a talk perspective. But what I can do then is as I'm writing this outline, I can say, okay, so I know that it was in Think Again, chapter three. Oh, I see, apparently not in chapter three. How do I call it? Oh, I didn't put Think Again in the file title. So chapter three, here we go. Uh, the joy of being wrong, Think Again. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, here we go. And then I can use the caret and the carrot here is what's going to allow us to basically pick. And so I'm going to choose the quote again. Let's see. What was it called again? This one is who you are. Okay. Let's see if I can find that in here. So there's my carrot, who you are. There you go. As you can see, Obsidian basically comes through the entire document and I can refer to the specific section. And so the great thing about this is if I just put an exclamation point in front of it, then now my outline is a lot more interesting because now I get, okay, I'm talking about my fact regarding the brain being able to retain a certain number of items. And so, and maybe my point with this is like, okay, because we can only retain a certain number of items at any given time, you know, the point here is it's important to be able to swap items out with ease, right? Because if you're unable to shift your perspective, you'll get locked into certain ways of thinking and then it'll be hard to kind of take in new information. Now you can see here, the beautiful part about this is that now that I've embedded basically the quote, a specific part from where it was inspired, this allows me to keep working through my ideas and thoughts while maintaining that relationship. So what I mean by that is if we take a look at the local graph here, so I'll just do this the, using the command palette. So for me, it's command G is normally what I would hit. You'll see now that this how to process non-technical non notes that I have is now actually being related to the actual chapter three. And so I think this is the kind of thing that gets interesting over time where as you get in the practice of doing this and referencing different pieces of notes, you get this really beautiful relationship graph, um, graph as a result. So with that, let's see. And then the final part of this question, I think that actually I do want to cover before I wrap this one up is I keep taking notes on only on not using actual those, especially the non-technical ones I am note taking. Okay. So I think the, what I'm getting from this is that you find yourself sort of b biased towards one type of note taking, whether you're, I can't tell whether you're referring to the technical ones or the non-technical ones. Usually what I see people do is they tend to really like to take notes on the technical stuff because it's really, again, it's really clear to, it's really easy to very clearly delineate like what's what. So, you know, one plus one is two. That's very easy to take notes on. You'll always remember that, you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Softer things, those are trickier because it takes time to process those things. And so what I would say is, again, it's okay to lean into what you're used or what, what you like taking notes on. But if your goal is to actually like sort of exercise the other muscle, the key here is just to, particularly with non-technical things, give yourself space to process. Because if you expect yourself to take notes at the same speed you take the technical stuff in, I think this is why a lot of people tend to like kind of stop they don't tend to take notes on that part. It's because it requires you to kind of reflect and allow your brain to sort of sit in it and marinate in it. So if that doesn't answer your question though, Josh, as always, please feel free to reach out. But uh, yeah, that's kind of my high level spiel on taking non-technical notes. Okay. So let's go back and, oh, oh, this is okay. This is what I'm doing now. So that was my spiel, right? And I need a way to, so check this out. In Raycast, they added this new thing called confetti. So if you didn't see that again, so Raycast, for those who don't know, that's just basically, basically a command palette for your like operating system. I think it only works on Mac, unfortunately, at the moment. But they added this feature where if you type confetti, it's just this thing where it'll just like basically, 
if there was a bunch of confetti on your screen. And the reason why this is gonna be very helpful for me is because editing can be tricky sometimes. So having that visual indicator of confetti blowing up, that'll let me like very easily kind of, or a lot easily, more easily cut things up. Okay, so we've taken care of this. Okay, so, oh man, this is a tricky one. All right, let's refactor this note. And actually, I do need to actually rethink how I'm gonna, my refactoring process is a little bit broken at the moment. So let me go ahead and update this. Okay, so the next question here. All right, do, 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 let me take out this bookmark. Okay. All right. So for this question, what we're looking at here is the process of going through bookmarks and articles. So the general problem that I think a lot of us have is when you're going through your different Chrome tabs, you have a lot of things that you want to read or want to look at later on. And this is something I think most of us deal with on some capacity. And so to be honest, this has just been a very tricky thing for me in general. I've attempted a lot of different ways of doing it. There's a lot of like sites for like having a to, to read list and those sort of things. And so currently the way I'm managing it within Obsidian is that I actually have, I make use of my statuses. So what's a good example of this? Let's, let's go ahead and bring up, let's do, let's do this live, shall we? We're going to go to CSS tricks. All right. For those that don't know, CSS tricks is a great place for front end articles and these sort of things. And so let's see, is there anything interesting? Let's see. Okay. So. Here is an article by Miriam, Miriam Suzanne, who, if you haven't checked out her content before, she's wonderful. And she's talking about CSS cascade, letter, CSS cascade layers. So inside of here, she has obviously a lot of content here that I would love to learn about because I'll be honest, as I love writing CSS, I haven't had the time to learn about cascade layers. So here's what I do is I would take this. And basically inside of Obsidian, I would just make a quick note, uh, basically, and I'll say, actually, you know what? I'm going to copy this real quick. So I'll go, okay, so here's my CSS cascade layers article. And then what I'll do is I'll do a couple of things. I'll first jot down the URL. So the URL was here. And then I always like to like, so I know this is Miriam's article. So I'll say the creator of this is Miriam. Okay. It looks like she, this is our first entry inside of the obsidian vault and then finally what i do though is i add a status so you can certainly templatize this it's just this is i just created a brand new note so that's why there's very little metadata in here and so the status here i have is i'll go like backlog and to be honest you can call it whatever you want and the reason why this is nice is because oh actually not even just type note though this is type article so what i end up getting here is i have an article dashboard and you can see here <laughs> it's kind of long actually let me do a table from type article oh that's not what i wanted ouch it broke table i think i just want status can i do that there we go okay so you can see here i'm not i'm not sort i haven't really sorted it out yet because again this is still very much a work in progress for me but if you think about it like this the way we could actually you know what what, what am i talking about i'm just gonna live do this so what we could do basically is we could just say here's a backlog so let me do how do i card box okay that's fine that, that looks like a good backlog emoji okay so what i do here is i just basically type article and status backlog so then i'll just actually add creator here or maybe i'll just do url that should be fine there we go okay so here we go now i have the everything that i want to read upcoming and then so you can use the tag to basically organize things and that way you can kind of get a sense of it I think what gets tricky though is what I've personally so on the mission to solve is that a lot of times when you're looking to sort through different things as far as articles you want to read, you're probably in a specific mood. And so what I mean by that is that you could do this, right? It's very easy to add any articles you want and create like a backlog, um, currently reading or have read, have taken notes. You, you, you can kind of do the process that makes the most sense for you. But the tricky part that I've found is that over time, at least for me, I have call it different parts of me or personas that care about different things when I'm wanting to read. So if I'm in, let's say I'm in my like coding mood, then I, also, I obviously want things to be highlighted from a coding perspective versus like, I'm not, maybe I don't really care about the psychology stuff that day. Or if I'm really want to learn about psychology and communication, then that's the only things I want to learn about. I don't really want like CSS stuff to show up in that list. So in that regard, I would recommend then creating different article dashboards for those personas. 
And so even to the point where like, for example, honestly, we could probably do something, what do, 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 what do I want to do? Okay. I'm going to tag CSS in this, this sort of illustrated point here. So if I'm like the coder dashboard, right? So this is a dashboard for my coding personality. Then, and when I say personality, not necessarily like split personality, just in the sense of like, this is like the persona that cares about coding right now. So we probably could just have like an articles or like to read section because this is like when I want to things I want to build. So this, you could, we could certainly do projects, for example. And then that's a little out of scope of the question, but you, you kind of get the, the gist here. And so here is where we could definitely basically go, like we could organize it. So if I, I can technically go like, oh, these are all my CSS articles. So if we did data view here, we could do a list from type article. And let's just say, I think this should work. And CSS, there we go. So now it takes, basically it takes all of my articles and anything that's tagged directly with the link of CSS will get included in this. Now, granted, you can go all the way down as far as like, like you, again, you can sort and organize however you want. I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds of uh, all like the filtering and that kind of stuff, but this is a way for you to basically manage your bookmarks and articles. And so the way I like to think of it, this is that. When you go to the point, when you spend the time here to organize and think through your workflows, that's basically your best way for figuring out how to process bookmarks and articles is to get to the information that's relevant to you. And that's why I think, or not I think, one of the reasons I love Obsidian is because it lets you track it from multiple perspectives. Because while, like I said, like the coder dashboard cares about it from like a whether CSS is tagged from it, maybe I'm just curious about learning something new. And so a generic articles dashboard is actually a great place for me to go. And then more importantly, if I'm like, oh, wait, I actually, I have something from work now that requires me to learn about CSS Cascade. I mean, one, when I do CSS Cascade, you'll notice it shows up in my search. But more importantly, I can also be like, oh yeah, Miriam wrote something about this and I could open up Miriam's dashboard. Like it lets you move into things from different places. And so as long as you keep that core concept in mind when creating your process for going through bookmarks and articles, I think that's the best way for you to personalize it to what you want. So hope that was helpful, Josh. Okay, confetti. What's that question? All right. Boom. All right. And then I think we have one more question, actually, before we get to Mark's, which actually is a video I've been looking to create. So I'm excited for that. Okay. So, do, 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 do. Oh, this is a good. Okay, yes. Let's talk about the end goal of note taking. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Need to delete this embed. Okay. Okay. I see some comments. Okay. I'll get to the comments. Actually, I'll, let's do some comments right now. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Prince, thanks for the words of support. Yak Neve. Yep. Hello. Hello. Let's see. Big flat. Yeah. Reflection. Reflection is one of those things that honestly, I, I, I'll be honest, like I have challenged making space for that too, because it's easy, particularly in the day and age we live in to just go, 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 go. So I, I totally understand. And it's why I have to always remind myself, to be honest, to make time for that reflection. It's because it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like you, you're, you need to work on the car engine to like make it more efficient, but you really can't do that when the car is running. <laughs> you gotta turn the engine off and, and kind of allow the pieces to cool off so you can actually see what's going on in there. Otherwise, if everything's just going through, you're just never gonna be able to really process things. Do, 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 Dave, reasons to switch to Raycast. Honestly, Raycast is pretty amazing, not gonna lie. And then again, saying that as an Alfred user. Belaya here, oh, thanks for checking in. Yeah, yeah, doing, doing better now, so I appreciate it. Dave, oh, this is a good question. Do you feel like you go back through that stuff in real life, not just on stream? Yeah, so I mean, again, this will, this is uh, more of a just chatting. So uh, for me, uh, what I'm in the process of trying to create is a way to respect the different parts of myself. So I know that might sound a little bit odd, but I, I, I've talked about this in various parts and I'll formalize a video around this. But I do have this theory that we have different, I'll call it personas that often have different priorities. And so when I'm in coder mode, I have different things I care about. When I'm in, you know, like creator mode, like content creator mode, that's a totally different personality or like different, different set of priorities. And so from the sense of like going through that stuff, like I'm trying to create a way so that when I'm switching the personas and things have like, I care about different things that it's able to respect those things. 
And that is what is kind of tricky right now is because as I'm going through and realizing, at least for myself, there are a lot of different personas. And so one of my challenges is a lot of times they end up clashing together. So you can imagine that sometimes like the writer persona has things they want to write about. And then funny enough, the coder, like the content creator persona has things that they want to create content about. But if you cannot align those things well, you'll find that the writer goes off and does its own thing. And then later you'll be like, the content will have things you're supposed to write about that would have aligned the content and the writer together, which is kind of tricky. And I know that might sound a little bit convoluted, but I'm working on a way to formalize sort of how to talk about it. But yeah, it, it is a tricky thing. So yes, I do I do try to go these, through these things in real life and I'm looking for a better way to automate and connect these things because I do think that if one of my theories is one of the reasons a lot of people, I'll speak specifically to what I've noticed in tech, but a lot of people tend to experience burnout is I think there is a misalignment of parts when it comes to the, the efforts they're trying to do. So, and then it's very easy to end up overbooked. And I don't think it's a matter of just, if it were really that simple, I think this would have been solved a long time ago and calendars would have done the trick. But I think it's trickier than that. So that's one of the reasons I'm sort of like working through that right now. That's kind of like the, the, the problem. If you want to ask like what my brain is churning on, it's, it's this very concept. And so I'm trying to figure out how, how to do that well for everyone. And so, yeah, I, I would definitely be keeping you all update, uh, updated as I uh, work through that. I see Joshua in the chat. Hello, hello. We've gone through your first two questions. We're on the last one right now. But then, yeah, there'll be the, the recordings will be up later. So yeah, Dave, I have so many thoughts on burnout, productivity, like, like sort of the, the, the age of what I'm calling toxic productivity. That's what I think we're in right now is where everyone's just trying, they're misaligning on the wrong metrics and everyone is really busy and doing a lot, but they're really confused as to like, what did they like when they, at the end of the week, they're just like, what did I do? And I think it's a travesty that we have so many talented individuals and people who could do a lot to contribute and they're getting burned out by these things that, ah, anyways, I have so many, so many thoughts on this. So that, again, refining that over time, honestly, this is probably going to be a, a, a theme and then within the productivity power hours that I'd love to share and, and what I'm learning with these things. Hey, what's up, Josh? Okay, so let's, uh, let's do this next part. Okay, so, <clears throat> right, the new recording. I always have to remember when I start a question, it's a new recording. All right. So here we have another question here from Josh. And the question here is, what is the end goal of note taking? And this, this is a good question because really what we're thinking about here. So actually, let me read the question. What is the end goal of note taking like on the last stream that I did regarding success? Do I like read the notes to keep me remember? What is the purpose of things like that? So let's, let's context set for a little bit. So in the last stream that we had, uh, which the recording should be up, we talked about this concept of what is success. And so Josh's question here is like, when we take notes like this, how does this relate later on? Right? It's like, is this something I review on a daily basis? How, like, why are, why am I taking these notes? And this is a, honestly, a great philosophical question. And if you've been kind of checking around the productivity note taking space for a while, the concept of second brain with things like Notion, Rome, Obsidian, and, and many others, to be honest, has kind of taken the world by storm. And I think the reason for that is because people are trying to find better ways of managing all the information they have in a way that's honestly, I, I think, personalized to them. And I think the personalization is key. Now, of course, with this particular question, though, around the end goal of note taking is like, why are we doing this? Right. Most of us approach note taking from like an academic perspective. We have a class we're taking. So we're taking notes so that we can remember things and then so that we can review them. And then we have the most efficient way of reviewing things for the test. Like that's kind of like I'll say like the standard academic flow for why people take notes. Now, in this particular question, though, in the last stream I did, I was taking notes and we were sort of having this con uh, sort of discussion around what the idea of success is. And so as you can see here, we were taking, I took notes on some of the things the audience was talking about regarding like most people perceive success as like high paying jobs, title, having comfortable life, money, a lot of different things. And so the question here is, what is the purpose of me taking a note like this, right? Like, do I just go back and read these notes to help remember things or what is it exactly? And so memory is certainly the most obvious reason for taking notes, but I would say a lot of this is almost for me, actually, as I've thought more about note taking and second brain stuff in general, it's about the serendipity of connecting ideas that you would have never thought had a relationship. 
And so in other words, as we can see here, what is success here was something that we talked about on, actually it was on the Productivity Power Hour episode six. And so we can see here that because it's, so actually let me just show the graph for this real quick. It's co connected to this um, event, which I have here. But then from here, you'll see that it branches out into the different things that we talked about in that. And the reason why I think this is important is because one of the things I think that makes you like the, uh, we'll go a little bit philosophical with this, the human species, right, is like what makes us very interesting, I think, is innovation, invention upon new, th like and creating new ideas. But a lot of times, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but innovation often they say comes from, there's like, it's, it's a new idea in a field, but often it's borrowed from an, a different field, right? So it's an old idea somewhere else that someone took and repurposed somewhere else, and it becomes new and innovative because within a specific field, it's something that no one's really thought about before. So a clear example of this actually that happens within technology is computer science we know has been around for quite some time. But front-end development um, hasn't really matured as a profession until, I'm not even going to say how many years, I can't remember that off the top of my head, but it's fairly recent, right? And so what we see here is a lot of people looking back at, call it like old, again, old is relative given that it hasn't been that many years that computer science has existed, but we looked at traditional concepts, like actually a great example of this is David Corsid, who wrote X-State and the whole idea of state machines. And so anyone who's known the history of computer science will tell you state machines has been around for a while. But with front end becoming more mature as technology has evolved and the capabilities are there, state machines has become like a really popular topic within front end. And it's kind of been like an innovation within the space. And so within the context of this question, right, why do we take notes? The reason I take notes, at least, is because over time, you'll start to get this sense of like where things exist. Because a lot of times when you rely on your own brain to go, well, I had this idea at one point regarding success and it was an interesting thought, but I can't really remember what we talked about or why it was. The thing about things like taking notes in Obsidian or things that have graph relationships is that you can go from, okay, I did what is success. And inside of here, we talked about success and metrics, defining impact and these sort of things. And the reason this is particularly powerful then is because this is actually a real life case scenario is Remote Connect 22, which if you didn't know, that's happening in April. So I guess let me a quick shout out for that actually in the, actually, that's fine. Remote Connect 22 happening in April. I wrote a talk for that and gave a talk on called the recorded a talk. So it's still, it will be delivered then called the only productivity metrics that matter. And inside of that talk, I actually went back and referenced that what a success conversation because basically in the talk, I'm thinking about what productivity means. And a lot of times people equate productivity with success. And so that brought me back to that entire line of thinking. And so that to me is really the end goal of note taking. Honestly, it's about relationship between ideas that you wouldn't have thought possible. So now granted, there are a lot of other reasons to take notes regarding like, re like quick referencing things and, and those sort of things. But the hidden value, I guess is my final thing is being able to just, when you're going through a graph and just seeing like, again, I, I just for the sake of like, this is my full graph here and then it's still being rendered. But like inside of here represents a myriad of possibilities of relationships that either already exist or are just waiting to be connected between one another. And so, yeah, I think that, that I think that about sums it up. And actually, no, I'll add one more point though. The other benefit to note taking, to be honest, is that what you ultimately get, especially when you're leveraging software, like I'll speak specifically to Obsidian. Um, and I think Rome does this as well. I think with similar efficiency, I wouldn't say Notion does this as well though. And at least I haven't seen it, been able to do it this well, is that you get a personalized search engine. And I'll save that for a whole nother conversation, but the ability to search your brain essentially and your past experiences in a way that makes sense to you, that is not limited to a one specific linear concept of like, oh yeah, I, I wrote, I opened a Word document that I put, that I saved in a folder that I put somewhere three months ago. Like those usually get lost. I don't know about you, that, that get lost for me constantly. So having things like this and being able to break things out and fragment them into like a graph relationship, that is, that is the beauty of note-taking. So I hope that helps Josh. 
Okay, with the app, confetti, that was that question. Okay, I see some stuff in the chat. Omichi here, psychologist developer is a dope com. Hey, I'm glad you think so. It's definitely been an interesting journey for those that don't know. Uh, my background is actually in industrial organizational psychology. We also call it IO psych. So I don't, I'm not traditionally uh, trained as a programmer. A lot of my tech skills come from being self-taught and just loving web development when I was younger and just sort of breaking into it. I wish I had known I could have done it as a career because I would have gotten into it way sooner, but I just, I didn't know. I was like, oh yeah, HTML, CSS, this is fun. Like anyone can do this. And then, and then I found out later, people would pay you to do it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> uh, if only I had known sooner. And anyways, all right, so let's see, crash, crash. Okay, there you go, perfect. You probably don't get frustrated as much. Oh, I don't know about that. I, I, I probably like, I guess because I've studied it, maybe I have more, techniques and I've given more thought to like handling the different the, the ins and outs of careers and that kind of stuff but I am human just like the rest of you so the joy of realizing you don't do do a time absolutely oh right so I see first time chat and see Quahad has that's hello hello uh, yes I, I've seen the the graph talked about in a number of ways regarding I think the other one that people tend to think about when they look at this is like um biology. So if you think of like cells and like the nucleus and that kind of stuff, molecules is another one that um, tends to get talked about for this. So no worries. Appreciate it. Oh, on your website it says, oh, you're totally right. So Omichi, I haven't redeployed it yet. I, I made a mistake at one point and I thought it was supposed to be nine. It is eight. I will, I will update it on my website because I was, I had planned session eight. Uh, for a few weeks ago, but a few things came up, so I, that never ended up happening. So thanks so much for letting me know, though. I would definitely keep that up. Do, 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 do. Okay, I got a question from Josh here. Perfect. Okay, Josh, I'm gonna add this to the queue for if we have time later. But let me do uh, PPH series. Actually, no, I'm gonna do this. PPH eight. Do do. do. This is t okay. There we go. Perfect. I'll make a note here if we have time. All right. Perfect. All right. So I'm excited. So just to clarify, Omichi, so I've worked on Netlify. I'm on the Vue core team. I do not work for Obsidian, but I, I talk a lot about Obsidian. And then as well, actually Notion and uh, Nux, I'm a Nux ambassador. And so Notion, I've also done a ton of work with. And honestly, I could do some consulting for that if I wanted to. I think I've done so much. I, again, I, I love what Notion does and it's one of my core tools. So you basically, that's like the, the, the scope of, of my work and a lot of the tooling I use. So let's get to Mark's question. Mark, I hope you're still here, but let's talk. This is a, a video that I've been meaning to make for a while. So Mark, helping to finally kick off this discussion. So let's go ahead and make this note here. Ba -bum 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 -bum. And then it's going to say that it can't find the section. That's fine. I need to update my refactoring. All right. Bum, 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 bum. Ooh, Omichi. I learned Vue.js to use it as a front for Laravel. Yeah, Laravel is one of the reasons that Vue is very popular. Yeah, so anyone who has coding questions for Vue stuff, we usually do that on Tuesdays. So keep an eye on the schedule or I tweet about whenever I'm, I'm online. So I'm happy to, you know, answer questions for that on that stream. But yeah, I hope you are enjoying Vue. I certainly do a lot. That's the reason I spend so much time on it. But okay, so let's do this. All right. Do, 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 do. Ooh, all right. Wicked Fritz. Okay, perfect. I will, I'm going to actually, you know what, before, before we get started, actually, to do, do, do for, to do, copy, adding it to here. And then actually, let me make sure I can give shout outs to people for their questions. All right. Perfect. Let's go. All right. So, do, 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 do. Okay, we good? We good. All right. So one of the questions I get asked a lot when it comes to looking at my Obsidian setup and what I do is what is the value of the front matter that I have? So let's go ahead and start by level setting. What is front matter? Well, front matter, for those that don't know, inside of Markdown is essentially just a section at the very, very top, right? In other words, it's the front and it's a bunch of data that you can associate with the document. So it's basically metadata. And so as you can see here within, actually, let me, let me break this. Actually, I'll keep it here. You'll see that within my front matter, I have four fields that I uh, basically manage. I manage a UUID, which stands for a U basically a unique identifier. This is the created date when the note was created. This here is the date it was last modified. And then here are aliases for allowing me to rename the file so that I can reference it in different ways um, while still referring to the same document. So the question here is, 
why one why would you want let's start with why would you want this and, and then i'll get more into the specifics of mark's question so it, actually no, no no sorry the first question really should be is it required and the answer is 100 percent no it's a personal preference thing but for those that have done development or have written sort of any sort of markdown it's nice to have this front matter bit it's because it's a a agreed upon standard to which you can basically assign different properties to a document that can then be leveraged in a programmatic way. So examples of this include like being able to like set a publish date so that the publishing engine will schedule it for the specific time. So inside of here, the question here is, can we talk about the use case of why I have basically designed my front matter the way I did? And so let's start with the very first one that Mark actually brings up, which is a great question, which is the UUID. So this here is an artifact from a methodology known as Zettelkasten. So if you don't know, it's like, it's called basically the note box. And the reason the UID existed was because the idea here with the Zettelkasten, so actually, let me, let me bring this up. Zettelkasten, here, so you can see here, Zettelkasten, and actually you can see this is an old version of my front matter. So actually, I'm just gonna update it real quick. You'll notice here that basically there's a bunch, like Zettelkasten was inspired, or sorry, Zettelkasten is built on the idea that everything is a note card and it would have a specific ID that you would reference it to another note. So you could basically shorthand be like, this note relates to 8.1 and 8.1 relates to 9.2, etc. Now, computers have certainly made this a lot more easier. You don't have to write everything via like a series of basically like numbers. However, one of the things I have noticed though is that for those of us that are creating blog posts and that kind of thing, having a UUID can be very useful because it allows us to basically have a unique key. So this is for like parsing things, um, making sure that things are unique. And my argument here with why the UUID exists the way it does is, and by the way, here's how it's being created. The front matter is being actually, the UUID is being created based on the creation date because my basic theory here is that you're never going to create two notes at the same time. I mean, granted, that is possible if you're doing something programmatically, but note taking is at least when you're taking notes is a linear process. You'll like open a new note, write something down, open a new note, write something down. Even if you want to write open three notes, like you have to do that sequentially. There's no pro programmatic way to be like, sorry, let me clarify. There's no easy way for you to just naturally create three files simultaneously. So as a result, I found that the, it was quite reliable to say that my creation date is going to be my UUID. And as a result, I get two things out of it. One, I have a unique identifier, but two, I have a built-in timestamp actually for when something was created, which is kind of nice. Now that said, you might be like, well, then your created is a little bit repetitive and it is, it is a little repetitive, but it is properly formatted so that it is in the ISO um, 8601 format so that I can actually use it for when I'm either like publishing things or copying and pasting it for other things. The other thing here, last modified is another date that I track. And so this one here, if you, you'll probably notice and what a lot of people get confused is they think that because it's programmatic here inside of the template, that it is programmatic forever. And that is unfortunately not the case. This is a static value. So right now I did want to update it. I'd have to basically go ahead and insert um, my last modified timestamp and then that'll go ahead and update it. So you can see here that the time was updated to 36. There, there are people trying to create solutions around this, but the reason I have this is for the simple reason that if I go ahead and open up this file, actually, I can't do that here. I think I can only do it here. Open in do 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 reveal in navigate. Oh, wait, not reveal in navigation. That's not what I wanted. I want to open it in the finder. If I can. OK, show in System Explorer. OK, here we go. All right. So you're probably, some of you are thinking like, oh, well, the computer tracks that for you already, right? Look, it says created today, 1115, modified 1121. So the reason why I do this is because sometimes I've noticed that when things, the computer takes backup, I don't know if it's Dropbox or something, it'll make a copy of this and basically kind of like delete this original one. And then like, it'll like basically somehow like scrub all the metadata. And so all of a sudden now, if we look at what is... What was the question? Oh, da, 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 da. oh, yeah, what's the value of front matter? There you go, right? As far as the computer is concerned, it was created at 11, 2022. But we'll know that like here, the note was actually created at on like the 31st. Or sorry, not even the 31st. It was created at 11, 15. This is a little bit not a great example only because I created the note today. But you can imagine though, as your notes grow over time, to me, knowing when that idea happened is actually pretty valuable information, especially if it's done automatically for you and stored in a plain text format that cannot be easily overridden by something else. 
that is ultimately my value because you can imagine at some point you could actually like take that data and plot it along like a chronological graph to be like, hey, this is how like this is how my ideas have evolved over time. And that to me is super, super interesting. So that's why I do that. And then the last modified is just to show a difference. Because especially when it comes to things like blog posts, you want it's one thing to say when something's published, it's another to say when it was last modified. So that's why over time I've sort of ingrained that into my habits. So the question here then is do, 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 date value. I like the backlink. Okay. So and in connection with that regarding front matter too, this is one of the problems with front matter at the moment is that it doesn't create any really graph relationships between things. I think you can do tagging, but internal links do not work inside of the front matter as far as I'm aware at this point in time. So in other words, what Mark is referring to here inside of this question is that this 2022-31, um, which I do have a note for, unfortunately will not show that there's a relationship to this specific note. And so that is a bit of a downside and hopefully something that, well, yeah, I mean, arguably, I don't see why it wouldn't be included as far as like scraping, but that's sort of a bigger question for another time. So Mark, hopefully that helps to explain why I do front matter the way I do. Essentially, I do try to keep it to the essentials to the top. And I found that these are the most useful fields to me. It, and to be honest, if there's none other, if like if there's one type of front matter, I recommend everyone do because again, I said front matter is optional. But if I do have a, my recommendation, is the main one I recommend. If you do nothing else, is just have this template included at the top, alias, because the easier you can make it to like quickly rename something or just to be like, because for example, when I do a question like what is the question, I cannot put a question mark here. That is not a legal file name. But if alias is easily like available, I can very quickly just like come in and go, what is the question question mark? And now when I do, what is the question? You'll see that the question mark is appeared as an alias, or I can also do things just like, you know, cool question and then cool. Whoop, wrong thing. Cool question also leads me back to the same note. So that's the high level bit for that. Oh, wrong thing. PPH8. All right. So let's let's confetti this. Boom. All right. Mark, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, Tice Mar M Masaro. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have not found a good way to do that. There actually is a plugin that I was hopeful for that would update the last modified date when you edit the note, but I have talked to, to a bit of the community. And so, it is actually a rather tricky thing to under, like, to figure out when to automatically do it. Because one, if you simply tr like from a, this is a quick aside. If you check from a computer perspective, like, did they update the file? If they updated the file, update the modified date. The problem is, is that your file actually gets touched for a lot of, lot of different reasons. And so this could end up creating basically like is insanely, oh, it might not be infinite, but a really long loop of like, oh, it's updating itself. And actually not even, actually no, it would be infinite because if you think about it, when the last modified date in your front matter is updated, that is triggering an update. So then it would like update and update and update and update and update. <laughs> so, so that's part of the problem. So my argument, I think at one point was that if there is like in the perfect plugin, again, as like a scaffolded solution would be, you would basically choose a field that is going to be updated and that is ignored from a diffing perspective. So that if last modified as a front matter gets updated, that does not trigger a re-update. But anything else in the app, basically, uh, sorry, in the file, if there is a diff in the text change, that is what triggers the time. And I think if we could, if it was possible to be that, or it probably is possible, but it's just, it might be tricky to do well. Um, if we could be that granular with that configuration, I think it would be actually fairly simple to do, but that is a big if on the complexity of that. Oh, Michi. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate the, the support. Again, I'm just glad to have y'all here listening and asking these questions. It's honestly, that's, that's all that matters to me. Okay. So let's see. Oh, Josh, how did I do the animation? That is a Raycast thing. So here you'll see that if I command space, this is Raycast. Confetti recently built this in because you know, the team is pretty fun about this kind of stuff. So I can just like, boo, there's my confetti. That is not a Twitch animation or anything. That is just Raycast. Okay. So unfortunately I am coming up short on time because wow, time has flown. I realized this is why I used to do the 90 minutes, but you know, I'm just glad that we are getting the power hour started again. And so, um, Wicked Fritz, I will, your question is in my notes now. So I will basically, the next session, I will make sure to add that um, to the top of the queue. 
And so I do want to share one tip though before I leave because I did promise this in the tweet and actually it's worth sharing. But let me ask, answer one more question. So, and Josh, also I do have your question too, so I will answer that in the next stream. For how long have I been streaming? Gosh, I think I've been streaming since January officially. I've like been on and off about it, but I've been much more consistent. About, actually, no, I think I was streaming last year. Time is so weird in the pandemic. Ah, Feld of Allen. Okay, okay, yes, let's talk about that next time as well. So let me let me jot this down. Let's talk about do do shout out to Feld of Allen. Yeah, so will UIDs by date. Great. Yes, we'll talk about that for sure. Gosh, I still have all this stuff to talk about questions, refactoring, book highlights. All right. So this is the one I actually do want to make sure we get to today before I wrap up. Okay. So this is a, this is a, okay. So the recording would stop here so that YouTube. Okay. All right. So for those who are using Mac OS, there is something that I've been actually wrestling with, with for most of the time I've been using Mac OS, which is renaming files. And this might sound super silly, but I found, I discovered something recently that I'm not sure a lot of people know about and why I'm just going to dedicate to sharing this tidbit with everyone. Cause I think this is, this is a pattern that I think people need to know about. Okay. So the, the, the question here is how do you rename multiple files in Mac OS? And normally what people would, I honestly, I kid you not, my first solution for a long time was like, I have to write a note script where like, I have to like go in and I have to like go in and track and figure out what the pattern is and then figure out some regex. Don't get me wrong. That was my thought process. I didn't end up doing it half the time, but I was like, oh, I have to write like a shell script, a bash script to make it happen. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to do that. Okay. So for example, this is a, this is a perfect example. Okay. So right here we have my productivity power hour eight, right? So actually I'm just going to use Raycast to just look up, to quickly look up the file here. Okay, great. So I have my productivity power hour uh, number eight. You'll notice that, however, that all of my productivity power hours are written in a pretty consistent way, right? PPH parentheses episode number. The only problem is I'm noticing here is that it doesn't exist for the, the productivity power hour. Where's like number one, two, three, four. Well, if we take a look at this, you'll notice it's all right here. One, two, three, four. Oh, there's two twos. Oh no. Oh, this is the blog post, right? Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. So the question here is how would you go about renaming it? Right? The manual way is obviously we could go in and we can be like, okay, well here I'll delete this. This is PPH 001 renamed, right? The problem, as we know, is scale. How do you do this at scale? Well, I found out something pretty fascinating. So here we go. Let's see. This is one, two, three, four. Okay. Four, one, two, three, four. Okay. I think I got them all. Okay. So what you do is you go into the file and you go to rename. And this is the magic of everything. You can do some pretty interesting things in here. So for example, you can replace text. So I can start by saying, okay, so productivity power hour is going to be replaced with PPH. And then that's it. It does. It's like the regex on this. Is, and then, so if you're like, oh, okay, well, like, what if I want to be more specific, right? So now I'm going to like modify stuff. The renaming not only lets you replace specific strings with it, you'd actually add text. So you can be like, oh, well, I'm going to prepend all of this with like, heck, let's just say live stream, right? Let's say we want to all my notes start with live stream. Like I can just add that text to the beginning of it and then it'll update everything. You can even say before name, you can say after name, and then it just works. You don't have to write a script or anything. And then I don't know, maybe everyone knew this already, but I didn't. And it is, it's just, that has been such a pain. Yeah. See, so fell the Valen here in the chat sharing that. Again, people have had different tooling to do it. And I've seen that as well, right? Different file managers to rename things, but gosh, <laughs> I see Charlie here The yes, I have spent so much time using other apps to do this when it was literally just as simple. And, and again, I actually find the UI incredibly intuitive for what you need, which is usually replacing a very specific type of string. And then after that, you basically need to prepend or append something. Now, granted, if you're doing transformations, like you want to take like the time date stamp and transform it into like month, a year that honestly, that is actually even not that hard. I think I did that recently because I had one, I had a bunch of files where it was like 2021, 03, 31. And then I just replaced all of 2021 with, with 2021. And then I did like 03 was March. And then I just flipped the strings a couple of times. It was done. So 
Anyways, that is my hack, my, my quick tips on productivity within Mac OS for renaming multiple files within your app. Okay. Bum, bum, bum. All right. Okay. Woo. We're, that is, <laughs> that is that for today. Let's see, da, 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 looking at the chat. I'm glad that some of you found that tip useful because when I found that out, I was like, how many years? And I'm, I'm not joking, years. I spent years wrestling with this in different ways and I had different workflows, but that is by far the easiest thing <laughs> for me to have done. So with that said, thanks everyone for hanging out today. It's been an absolute blast. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend and I'll talk to you all next week. Bye everybody.